Again, we'll, we'll try to go through questions. If we get a lot of questions, we might have to wait till the end, but hopefully we can kind of answer stuff as we go through. Uh, so, this is the 17 tax cut and jobs act, uh, business provisions. Uh, for, first of all, when we go through this, there's gonna be permanent provisions, temporary provisions. That word, those words have very little meaning. It depends what they can pass for the budget. It depends who switches to office, if anything happens like that. So uh, some provisions they made a couple of years ago for the tangible purple, <coughs> tangible uh, property rules were made in effect a year and a half ago, permanent, and with the new law, they're out the door. So nothing's really permanent. Uh, some of the business provisions, C-Corps, I don't know if we have a lot of people have still C-Corps out there. They got rid of all the different rates from 15 to 35, put in a flat 21% rate. So we'll talk a little bit more about C-Corps, and Dave will talk about pass-through entities and Schedule Cs and single-member LLCs. We'll kind of compare the two after that and just see which one might be better in a general aspect. Uh, they also got rid of the alternative minimum tax with the, for C-Corps. So C-Corps, they really tried to simplify, and they did it for everybody. The main purpose, though, was really international, trying to make us more competitive with international companies, international, different uh, countries around the world who had lower tax rates. So that's kind of was the driver for this. And coupled with this, they get into other items for passive entities, trying to make it a level, a little bit more of a level playing field between what type of entity you are. And uh, they're not all exactly equal, though. Uh, with the C-Corps again, uh, if you have net operating losses, you have a big loss in one year, you used to be able to carry it forward, could deduct it the next year if you had income. Now they're going to limit that. You can only use 80% of the loss going forward. You don't lose it, but you only can use 80% of income. And, if you get, and that's for losses that occurred during 2018 forward. If you have old losses, you can use those all up uh, against your income. Uh, you used to be able to carry losses back, so, you know, one bad year, but you had been paying tax, you still go back, get your money back. No longer, it only carries forward. So they kind of limited how you can use losses. You can use the losses indefinitely going forward now. Previously, you can only carry them forward 20 years. Uh, again, the ones subject to prior to 118 are not subject to 80% limitation. Uh, like kind exchanges, with everybody being in real estate here. This was a pretty big deal. They kind of got rid of like kind exchanges, but then they put it back on that they still applied to real estate. So you used to be able to do it with cars, business property, you could do like kind exchanges. Now it's just limited to real estate. So it was really a key provision for your industry. Uh, it allows your, you and your customers to be able to defer gain on a property into the future. So a uh, big thing that they kept that around for property. Uh, small business accounting methods and reform simplification. Again, I'm guessing most people are probably in the cash basis, but if you weren't for whatever reason, size of your company, they changed a lot of rules for basis of accounting methods. So if you're below 25 million, if you were on a accrual basis, you can switch to cash, cash method if it's more favorable. Uh, again, inventory is probably not a big issue, you guys, but in some cases you might not be able to show inventory anymore. And there's some unit cap rules related to inventory that don't apply. If you're dealing with contractors for clients, if they're a small uh, commercial contractor, they might have had to use a percentage of completion method in the past. They're no longer required to use that. Uh, AMT would still apply to them, though. Uh, and so, again, I don't know how much this would apply to you guys, but some of our examples, some of our clients in different industries, they were a uh, cruel basis. They're switching to cash basis. Uh, so they might have a lot of receivables, a little bit of payables, so now they're able to take that, write it all off in one year, the difference between the ca cash basis and accrual basis, one year adjustment. So if, you, if you're in that situation and, and need to go from accrual to cash, it can be very favorable if you have the right circumstances. Uh, bonus depreciation. Again, very big for uh, you guys as being in practice and also for your clients. Uh, bonus appreciation was temporary for a lot of years. Uh, now it's kind of permanent uh, through 100% uh, through 2022, and then it gets reduced each year through 2026. But they've gotten rid of bonus appreciation. That allows you to write off whatever fixed assets you're buying, basically. You can take them, write them off, and here you buy them. So for tax purposes, it's very advantageous. 
Uh, bonus depreciation is supposed to have ended several times. It's supposed to end in 2026. They keep on extending it, so they could always change the law, get rid of it, but right now it's through 2026. My guess is it'll probably stick around longer than that. Uh, it also applies to used and new property. Uh, previously only applied to new. So if you're buying used equipment, you want to take it off, write it off now with using bonus appreciation, you can and get 100% deduction right away in the year you do it versus having to do it over five, seven years maybe, or 15 years. Uh, the bonus appreciation only does apply to asset classes that are 20 years or less, so real property, the buildings, residential property, you can't write off the property necessarily, although we'll talk later and you can write off components. Uh, only applies to arm length transactions, so if you have related companies, you're selling stuff back and forth, you can't really play too much with that and do it that way. Uh, and even though the federal's allowing you to take this bonus depreciation, New York State's decoupled, which means they're not following the federal rules, so you buy a piece of equipment, maybe a new computer system for five, ten thousand dollars $10,000, you can write it off for federal, but you cannot write it off for New York State, they're still gonna make you depreciate it, so you have a difference between the tax methods there. Excuse me? Is that for anybody or is this still C? C Corp? Uh, bonus is for everybody. Bonus is for everybody. And we have Section 79, which is very similar to bonus. Again, it's a direct write off. Again, this is for everybody. Uh, one caveat with Section 179 is you have to be active in the trader business to be able to take Section 179. So if you had a business where you had maybe some passive shareholders, you wouldn't want to take Section 179 because they wouldn't be eligible to use the deduction. Uh, they also expanded uh, Section 179, and you can now do it for real property, including qualified improvement property, roofs, HVA systems, fire protection, security systems. A lot of those things used to have to be over a longer period of time, so or you know appreciate over a period of time. But now you can take Section 179 on them. Uh, there's a limitation; you can only do it for up to a million dollars in assets. So hopefully, it wouldn't or I wouldn't think it would affect many people in the room. And if you had more than $2.5 million in assets in a single year, you, once you go above that, it starts bringing down the, the million dollars for Section 179. So the bonus appreciation in Section 179, very good tool to get immediate deductions. Section 179, as long as you can take it versus bonus, might be a little bit better because New York State follows Section 179. It does not follow the bonus again. So you just want to be aware of that. Uh, cost segregation studies, a little... Advertisement here, we do have a component of our company called MS Consultants who do, do cost segregation studies. So you buy a piece of real estate, your clients buy a piece of real estate. If you have a cost segregation study, instead of like a commercial, commercial piece of real estate, you're gonna depreciate over 39 years. You can go in, it's kind of almost like an engineering study. They go down, they break the components down to take some of the money that's in that property and put it in five, seven, 15 year lives. And now you have a, either a shorter write off or maybe even write off as bonus depreciation or section 179. So uh, again, for you or maybe for your clients, something you should make them aware of uh, if they're buying large buildings that this option's out there. Again, it allows you to get deductions quicker, a lot shorter than a 39 year life. So if you're trying to defer taxes, push them off into the future, you can push them off quite a long ways by doing a study like this, taking advantage of it. Uh, Interest expense limitation thing is not going to affect too many people in the room, but there is now a limitation. If you have a very highly leveraged company, you have a lot of debt, you can be limited, your interest can be limited to 30% of basically uh, before 2021, it, it, uh, the net income plus interest, taxes, depreciation, amortization. So with those components, there shouldn't be too much of a problem with 30% limitation. After 2022, you no longer can add back the interest taxes depreciation, so it could be played a little bit more of a limitation. Again, this is really for highly leveraged company where, where you have a lot of interest. Uh, most companies probably don't fall into this uh, category. Uh, you do have to be aware though, if you have several companies and all your company's revenues together add up to $25 million, there's a good chance you're gonna be in this, you could be in this category if you're highly leveraged. If you're less than 25 million, you don't have to worry about this rule. Uh, but when you look at the 25 million, you do have to look at all the companies you own, not just on a company by company basis when you, when you have control or a group of people have control over the entities. Uh, some other provisions of the tax law that are 
<clears throat> not as favorable, uh, transportation, fringe benefits. So you have a business and you have spots for uh, employees to park. You're supposed to come up with the cost of what that spot is and you're not allowed to deduct it anymore. Uh, it's not too big a problem for areas around here, but we have some clients, some uh, large nonprofits clients of ours that have maybe 65,000, or uh, <clears throat> I'm sorry, about 10,000 employees. So they come up with a big, pretty big number that they can't deduct anymore. And what you basically have to do is look at the cost of what that parking lot is. So if you own the building and you're paying for snow plowing, striping, black topping, all that cost to go in, you figure out how many spots are for employees versus your total spots, and that's going to be a non-deductible amount. So it's something the IRS is going to be looking for in return. So it's something, whether you have a perfect calculation or not, you should make some attempt if you do have employees to show that non-deductible amount. Uh, they also started looking more at um, entertainment deductions, and they basically said entertainment is no longer deductible. It can still be a, a allowable corporate expense that you can deduct it through your corporation, but it's not going to be deductible for tax purposes. So you go to golf outings, you go to sporting events uh, with clients, fishing, anything like that. It's not going to be deductible. Meals are still deductible, and if you have a event like you have here, a realtor's uh, conference, uh, and to say if there was entertainment, you want to make sure you have everything broken out because uh, if you have entertainment meals together, it's just one bill. You can't deduct any of it, but if you're going to break out for what the meals were, what the entertainment was, just the entertainment point will, will be non-deductible. So again, the IRS on this, or Congress on this part, is kind of cutting back deductions. They're giving a lot of deductions elsewhere, but in some parts they're cutting back a little bit, and I think that's pri primarily because they have to balance the budget. And so they're trying to pick some areas that the public won't be as outraged for to increase taxes. Uh, uh, go ahead. Sorry. Uh, the entertainment's primarily for employees. What about brokers who have independent contractors? Can they still deduct all that? Those... <laughs> Those would not be considered employees, so it can be kind of questionable. But the, if it's meals and stuff like that, you still be able to, they're business people. And if you can document a business purpose, uh, you, you are supposed to keep contemporaneous records. So if you can document a business purpose, networking, et cetera, you know, the meals portion would probably could still be deductible. But if there's any, any entertainment or something like that versus a band or something like that, it's probably not going to be deductible because it's not an employee function. Okay, and uh, I'm going to turn over the speaker to uh, Dave to bring it through some of the small business qualified portions. All right, thank you, Ed. So this is really the, the crown jewel of the, of the new tax code in terms of this will probably affect, if you're an independent contractor and you get a 1099 and you have, is there a problem back there? No, it's a question before you go oh. on. It's still going to probably be considered golf. Uh, sometimes for a charity event, they might break out that there's a deductible por portion of the event <coughs> versus the total cost. So if you go to play golf, the golf portion might be $60 out of maybe a $200 if you're paying $200 a round or something like that. So the charitable portion would still be deductible, but the golf portion would not be. So as I was saying, this is really the the thing that gets the most publicity. So as an independent contractor, if you're getting a Schedule C, this is definitely going to affect, if this is definitely going to affect you. Um, so what does it mean? Well, it basically means that whatever you report on your Schedule C up to certain limits is you're going to get a 20% deduction of that income. So if you had $100,000 of income, you're going to basically get 20000 of it tax-free on the federal only. This is only a federal deduction, not a state deduction. Um, so there's certain qualifications you got to have to meet this and get this deduction. So one of the things is it's based on your income. So for instance, if you're married, your income is 315. This is collectively now, not just your income as maybe the Schedule C person. So if your income is below 315, you're going to basically, there's not going to be any limitations for you. You're going to get 20% of just the qualified business income. So if you have your Schedule C is 100000 you have a spouse that has a W-2, maybe earns $200,000, you are going to get 
$20,000 of that $100,000 tax-free. When you start to go up in income is when these other things start to kick in, because of course they can't make it that easy. So this deduction available, so whether you itemize or don't, it doesn't make a difference. It comes off your adjusted gross income. So with the new tax law, a lot of people that previously itemized will no longer itemize. That will not affect this deduction one bit. When it says it's only available for specified service businesses, okay, um, the specified service business industry, the income has to fall below at a married level of 315 in order to get an unlimited deduction. So what happens is all of the real estate industry was basically exempted. So they don't fall into this specified service business. They're just a regular business. So they're not subject to the additional uh, rules and uh, some of them are very stringent as far as when you can get these deductions. So doctors, lawyers, accountants, we do not get this deduction unless our income falls below at a married level 315. And again, the qualified business income is only for you're basically either pass-through income on a K-1 or, in most of your cases, Schedule C income. If you're an employee, you don't get the deduction on your wages. If you're a partner and you get guaranteed payments, you can't take a 20% deduction on those payments either. It's only your self-employed income. So this is where, based on those limits, so for instance, if you're a Schedule C, okay, and let's just say you're single, okay, and you have $200,000 of net profit, you are going to be in that phase in range where you're not going to get the full 20% unless you meet other criteria. So what has to happen is you may have to set up your entity that was previously a Schedule C and just a sole proprietorship, essentially. You may have to, to, to basically convert that to an S-Corp because what that will do is as your income goes up, especially if you envision that your income is, is going to maintain at a high level and if anything go up, you can then basically take wages from the S-Corp as basically the employee. And whatever the income that's left in the S-Corp, you will be able to get the 20% deduction on that. Because the limits, basically once you go over the limits, then the wage things kick in. So you'll see in the later slide how that works. And this second bullet here is just talking about it only applies to business incomes in which basically you're actively involved. It's a real trader business. It's not a hobby or something like that. So it has to be something you're really involved in and really earning your, your, your keep from. So here's just a very, it's a very simple example. So if you have a married taxpayer, let's assume that only one of the spouses worked and basically you earned $450,000. Your adjusted taxable income after you take your itemized deductions, maybe there's other things that go on, is $300,000. The entities, basically the wages of the entity, so this would be like if you have a pass-through uh, or you have wages within, like if you have employees, your, your wages within that entity are $50,000. In this case, it won't make any difference because you're basically, your deduction is always limited to 20% of your qualified business income or 20% of your adjusted taxable income, whichever is lower. So for instance, you would think, okay, I'll get a $90,000 deduction. Well, you won't in this case because your adjusted taxable income is only 300,000. So then you would only get 20% of the 300. They don't give you the bigger number. And in this, in this case, the wages is irrelevant uh, because you, your 20% is still going to be of the, the 300000 Because this, again, is a non-specified service trader business. So what that means is basically these other things about wages, and you'll see later on in some slides, aren't relevant in this case. So now the, the, the bottom part now. Here's another example. So now you have 600,000. Okay, so now you're above the limits because it was 315 to 415. Um, and it goes by your adjusted taxable income. So you'll say, well, the first example, you were at 450. Why was it limited in any way or why didn't it have to take any of these other things into account? That's because your taxable income was below the 415. 
Now in the second example, you're above 415. So now you have to jump through some other hoops in order to see what your deduction is. So in, your, in this instance, you'll see that as a result of this, you're going to get whatever number is lower in this case. So the wages now comes into play, and you only get a deduction up to 50% of your W-2 wages. So that gets back to what I was talking about. If you have to set up an S-Corp, you need wages, because if you're just the sole proprietor and have no wages, well, once you start to go above the th income threshold, you're going to get no deduction. So this example, you'll see you get the 25000 as opposed to the other example was 60000 which is basically nothing has changed here other than you just made more money, so you lost the $35,000 deduction. This outlines basically the significance of staying below the threshold amount. Okay, so the specified service trader businesses, this would be doctors, lawyers, um, accountants. If you have a spouse that is in that industry, this shows you basically if you stay below that threshold, how dramatically it can affect the amount of tax you pay. So basically nothing has changed here except now you have $100,000 more of income. And once that happens, you don't get this, the basically the 20% deduction any longer. So what that translates to is a, basically an incremental tax of $47,000 on just that $100,000. So that's a pretty high percentage. Uh, I don't think anyone would want to pay that. But obviously some of these things are beyond your control. But it just outlines the effect of this. But there are things that you can do in terms of contributing to your retirement plan. Like a lot of you probably do SEP plans. So if you're in that range where you can put more money into your SEP and get a better benefit from the deduction, it may make more sense to you to do that because you may not be getting it now or you may be getting a very limited amount. So, you know, talk to your accountants or whoever's doing your tax return about, hey, you know, how much of the deduction am I getting? Am I, am I getting limited in any way? Is there anything I can do with my putting more money into retirement to get more of a deduction? For those of you who like flowcharts, this basically takes you through the decision tree of how you would get the deduction. I won't go through it specifically, but you can see it's very complicated. It's, it's those of you that may have thought that you can do your return on TurboTax, <laughs> you, you, you may have some trouble this year. Um, so you may want to either you know, call one of us up or you know, look for someone local that you can, can go over this with, because it's very complicated. Now, for the, specifically for the real estate industry, if you have rental activities, in order for them to rise to the level of a trader business, you have to meet these requirements. Separate books and records, usually that's dicey sometimes, 50-50. Maybe you have a separate bank account and you keep track of the books in a separate entity. Maybe you just keep it track in Excel. It gets commingled with your own funds. This basically says, if you are able to meet these criteria, it's a safe harbor, and it basically they'll treat that business as qualified for the 20%. So if any of you have rental properties, this is how you would make sure you get that 20% deduction on any income from those rental properties. <laughs> this is just basically <laughs> telling us that they always talk about simplifying the tax code. They've done nothing to simplify the tax code one, one bit. If anything, they've made it worse. This just basically gets to that. So now we'll talk about the, what the new form looks like. And some of you may have filed your tax returns already. Some of you are in the process of doing it. So you can see this is basically your page one now. So when the president said we're going to make a postcard, this is his idea of a postcard. Here it is. But with the postcard comes about 10 or so new schedules, of course. So this will be the front page of your return, and you'll say, well, geez, there's no numbers left. There's no spots for any income or anything. Well, that's correct. It's basically just your basic information, and all the good stuff with all the numbers is on supporting schedules now. But he got his postcard. This is page two, where it basically is a, in summary format of all the different items of income that you would have, similar to the old return but not as detailed as the old return. Oh, I go back there. So if you look at line nine, that's the qualified business income deduction line. That's where that goes. 
So it basically goes right after your, your standard or itemized deductions. This is one of the schedules that supports that page, basically, which is the equivalent of what the old return looked like. So it gives all the lines. There's like six of these schedules that now are in the returns that didn't used to be in the returns. So the new 1040 has 23 lines. The old one had 79 lines. Wow, that's progress. However, there's all these new forms that need to support all these schedules. And yes, the font is smaller, and it's because it could, they wanted to make it look like a postcard. <laughs> you can still elect to donate to the presidential campaign if, if you're so inclined. <laughs> and Ed will talk about now how the entity choice can affect this. Did anyone have any questions about this before we? Sure, can you, can you step up to the mic? Just a question on the W-2 wages. If you have multiple entities, are you combining those entities for, you might have W-2 wages in entity A, entity B, entity C, are you putting them all together uh, to do that calculation? Yep, great question. So there's, there's rules of aggregation that you can make for those. So uh, a lot of the rules are, they basically have to be controlled by the same groups of individuals. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to have control, it's just the same group of people have to have control. So if you do meet that level, there's a couple more, Ed. Do you remember what they are? They get to be in a similar industry. You're right. You can't, None you can't, of the industries can be specialized combine. service trader businesses either. Right. So if you have a, a management company, which is a separate LLC, and ABC uh, Realty, which owns a single asset, you can use the W-2 wages from the management company to offset the income from a sole property LLC? Yeah. And uh, I, I can't remember we covered, but... Uh, with rental property too, rental property, in addition to the 50% for wages, they allow you two and a half percent of the adjusted basis, basis. Of the adjusted yes. basis of the property. So that might take care of the rental properties too. And, and they don't, it's not the uh, it's depreciated the basis. basis, the original cost, yeah. if it's still in its period of depreciation. And for personal property, they allow you a 10 year life versus a five or seven year life. So the 50% wage part, is one of the uh, calculations that you do. The other one is 25% of your wages plus 2.5% of the unadjusted basis. So whichever one, you know, is Which, less. Which is more advantageous or, you to know. you. Yeah. That, that keeps it simple, thanks. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Any other questions on the 20% thing? Because that's probably will affect everyone in this room, I would think. Yeah. So when you take the 20%, you could also itemize your deductions, you're saying. Oh, yes. Yeah. So itemize, whether you itemize or not is irrelevant for purposes of the 20%. There are two, two separate things that you're looking at. Mm -hmm. and, and just under 20% too, the real rental properties too, that's, you know, Dave went over to Safe Harbors with you, but there's always questions whether uh, a rental property is gonna be a qualified business or not. So if you have a, a lease and it's a triple net lease and you don't really do much for it, it might be hard to qualify that as a business just by itself. Because uh, the tenant is basically doing all the paying all the bills, there's nothing you're really doing, just collecting rent. I wasn't meaning actually if you own properties, I meant if you sell properties, what, you know, what you get on your 1099. The, the game is not going to be eligible for the 20%. Yeah, because the adjusted taxable income number, or the qualified business income number, doesn't include any capital gains or anything. Only just regular, ordinary self-employment income. Those gains that you're talking about wouldn't be self-employment income. Those would be, those would be considered investment income. Or, or rental income. Yeah. So they put it out there, but it's, like, again, it's not straightforward. Uh, you know, if you've got a W-2 and, and that's it, it's probably a simpler return now. and You might make out better. You probably make out better if you're living in Florida versus New York. <laughs> Depends what color your state is, a little bit how they did everything. And if you sell properties, and those are capital gain type things, the reason why they don't give you the 20% on that is because you're already getting the funnier rate on that, the, the beneficial rate. So they're not going to give you 20% on top of that. So that's, that's the theory. So it also goes if you have a lot of dividends and things like that, that doesn't factor in to any qualified business income. And they actually take that out of your taxable income to figure out the 20%. Yes? I have a question about um, personal property use for businesses. Has any of that changed for the, for the new tax year? 
I, I, mean, I don't think anything has changed. You still have to use it more than 50%. Is that what you mean? Not, not really. You're still going to have to look at your business use of the car, and and that will determine whether you need to maybe use mileage method or you can use the expense method, depending on if you're over the 50% limit or not. So not, none of that's really changed under the new law. Okay. Thank you. Yes. So if you if you you take these, you create a S corp because you're going to hit that 315 or whatever. Mm -hmm. If you're going to take distribution the following year, will it affect you negatively? Because you're trying to. Create so good question. Percent. Good question. So, if you have a Schedule C now and maybe you're making five hundred thousand, let's just say net. So, if you converted to an S corp, okay, and you took a base salary, there's always a question of what's reasonable compensation. But let's just say one hundred and fifty is reasonable. So now you've taken that five hundred that was previous on your Schedule C and made it three hundred and fifty thousand of S corp income, but now you'll start to get the 20% because you have wages. So then you can take 50% of the 150, which is 75, as your, that's your maximum you're going to get. But then you still have to run through those other tests as far as 20% of your taxable income. But at least now you're going to get something, whereas you, w you wouldn't get anything. You would right. get nothing. And the, and the distributions from the sub S don't affect taxable income at all. It's just a timing no, no issue. Matter. Just the important things are what the earnings were and what the wages are. So an S corp just basically you you get taxed on the income that's earned whether you took distributions or not. Okay. Anything else on this part? Perfect. Thanks. Okay. So, you know, when the first law came, tax law came out. The question was, well, now they got these corporations. You got the individual rates that top rate at thirty-seven percent. Corporations are twenty-one percent. So everybody's like, okay, we're going to convert everything to C corporations. So generally, it's not going to always work out. This is a very simple example. You'd have to really go through something with your accountants uh, or CPAs to kind of figure out where you're going to be. In certain situations where you're trying to build up a lot of capital in a corporation, it might be good to be a C corp for a while and get the lower 21%. But if you're ultimately going to take the money out so that, you know, how much money can come to me, you got the, you know, a pass-through entity and you have a C corporation. C corporation, you're still going to have a double level of tax. You're going to have the lower 21% at the corporate level, but then you're going to have to pay capital gains and you take dividends out of the corporation. So there's still a double level of tax. This is a very simple example. Again, use the 100,000 of income. If you look towards the bottom, the effective federal New York State rate on the C corporation to get the money to you is still going to be about 48% versus maybe 28% uh, as a pass-through entity. And in this example, you're below the 315 level, so none of those other limitations apply. So generally, pass-through entities, as a general rule, are still going to be better than C corporations. So, But you need to look through and really any of these things, especially all the stuff Dave was talking about with the qualified business income. You know, Should you be a sole practitioner? Should you be a partnership? Should you be an S corporation? You really have to kind of do a three or four year plan see where your income is going to be, and see what's going to be the best fit for you. Because if your income changes, you start down low and you go up high, one scenario might not be as good a fit as another scenario, or if you think your income is declining. So you really have to kind of look at it and see where you're, you're at. Uh, and you know, as Dave said, even with partnerships, if you have a partnership agreement right now and you're getting a guaranteed payment from your partnership, you might want to go back and we look at that partnership and see if you can restructure and take out the guaranteed payments because the guaranteed payments are, are almost like salary. You don't get the 20% on them, but they don't count for the 50% limitation either. So it's like a double whammy if you're getting guaranteed payments for a partnership. So all these entity situations, which one's going to really fit best for you? You really got to put pencil to paper and there's no really quick answer for anything. Uh, a little bit of the key individual tax changes are going on. Again, with budget constraints, they couldn't make these permanent as they did with the corporation tax rate, so they made them through 1126. So what they did is they reduced the top bracket and all the brackets from like 39.6 was the top bracket, now it's 37%, and then they stretched out the range of income that falls into those brackets. Uh, they also 
got rid of the dependency exemption, so those are gone, suspended. They come back in 2026, and they increase the standard deduction to 24,000 for married filing joint and 12,000 for individual. So uh, when we go further here, you're going to see a lot of people are not going to be able to itemize anymore if you're married filing joint. If you're single and have a house and you have a mortgage and real estate taxes, you're still probably going to be able to itemize, but for federal purposes, uh, if you're married filing joint, you might not be able to itemize very often. They also changed the AMT exemption. They increased it, and uh, the, the phase-out threshold increased. So if you've been in AMT, and you were usually in AMT because you were paying a lot of state income taxes, you're probably not going to be in AMT anymore because you're not going to be uh, having, you might not be able to itemize to start with, so you won't have to add back the taxes. And, uh, and even if you are, the, exempt, the threshold's gone up, so you're, you're probably not going to fall into AMT too much unless you're maybe a contractor and you're on a percentage of completion method and you have to do some adjustments for that. Uh, this is just the rates in the table, so you can see the lower rates 10 didn't really change. You go up to 15, the rate went down to 12. Next level, you get up to 25%, went down to 22, but the 156 went up to 165 now, so they stretched out the rate ranges. 28% went down to 24 again. Top rate part of 28% used to be 237. Now it's 315. So generally, all the rates went down. But again, in living in New York State, if you're losing some deductions for state and local taxes, you might not be a lot better off. Uh, moving expenses, uh, they've gotten rid of it, unless you're in the military. So if you're moving for jobs, you still get a deduction for that. That's kind of gone. Alimony. Alimony uh, used to be deductible by the person paying it and taxable to the person receiving it. So if you are under an existing uh, divorce agreement, you're still going to be in that category. But if you're getting divorced now, you really got to be careful. Uh, the reason they did this was because the people who were getting deductions were usually the higher pair of the two, pair, uh, <coughs> higher married er earning person. So they want to not give that person a deduction so that person has more taxes and they were, used, were giving the income to the person in a lower tax bracket. So that's kind of why they did that, to increase taxes. The child crack, tax credit doubled to 2000 per child up from 1400 They also raised the threshold so a lot more people will be getting uh, the child credit. They also put a new family tax credit. So now if you have maybe uh, older kids, uh, maybe parents or something that you're taking care of, you might be able to qualify for a family tax credit of up to 500. It's not as big as the child credit, but it is something that's there that wasn't there before. And uh, kitty tax is basically if your kids have some non-earned <clears throat> non income, you have some money in their names for interest and dividends. It used to be based on the parents' taxable income and tax rate. Now it's just based on the trust rate. So uh, not too big a change there, but it was a change. Itemized deductions, <coughs> P's limits, if you were really high income, they used to take away 3% of your uh, itemized deductions, so that's gone, suspended until 2026. SALT was the big one. That's the one that really kind of favors one state versus another. If you're in New York State, now you're going to get 10000 max for uh, state local taxes plus your state income taxes. So you own a house here and you pay in state income tax, you're probably going to be capped out the $10,000. Uh, they also increased the charitable contribution limit from 50 to 60 percent. <clears throat> and there's no deductions. If you were a big booster of a college or something and you were getting your seats and getting a charitable deduction, that's no longer going to be available. And then they got rid of miscellaneous itemized deductions. So if you're if you do have employees working for you, and maybe, you know, if you're an employee, this can hurt you. But if you have employees working for you, too, and you don't reimburse them for mileage and stuff, and they used to be able to deduct that. They can no longer deduct that. If you're an employee, you can no longer deduct that. So it's changed the playing field a little bit. So before, if they, you know, if you had an employee, and they were driving around a lot for you, and you're not, not getting reimbursed, and you kind of had a compensation rate. They're long, they're losing that deduction now, so they might be paying more taxes. So they might come back to you and say, "Hey, I need to get a little bit more or something because I'm not getting my deduction anymore." But with the standard. Uh, Deduction now twenty four thousand. If you're married filing joint, you know you're limited ten thousand for taxes. So that's ten thousand. So you still need another fourteen thousand before you even get any benefit from from itemizing. So unless you have a pretty good sized mortgage, 
you're probably not going to get over that 24,000 because the only other thing you're really going to get is charitable deductions. So, um, you know, this is also going to hurt a lot of nonprofits because uh, people might, if people are donating or maybe they donate more because they get a deduction, you might not be getting any benefit from, from your charitable contributions anymore. So, you kind of look at things you're doing maybe as a business owner. If you were giving away contributions before, maybe you don't give away a contribution, but maybe you do advertising in a nonprofit, uh, you know, newspaper or web page or something, and try taking it as an advertising deduction versus a charitable contribution. You do have to, it does have to be reasonable, though. You can't pay $5,000 for a little spot that nobody's going to see and say it's advertising versus a contribution, so you can't go crazy with that. But you might want to look at different things and different ways of doing things because it's going to be hard to get charitable contributions. One thing we talk about with a lot of our clients is if they do make a lot of contributions, maybe you bunch them up in one year. You do no, no contributions this year, <clears throat> and you do three or four years in one year, so you get above the 24000 get the benefit for that year. And then other years you don't do them. So you, if you want to get deductions for contributions, you got to be a little bit more creative and look at different ways of doing things. Uh, mortgage interest, big factor for what's going on in your industry, especially if you are from downstate. Uh, the new mortgage cap is $750,000 of debt. Uh, the old amount was a million dollars. So if you're over 750 and you get a million dollar new mortgage, you have to prorate your interest. You're only going to be able to deduct part of your interest for itemized deductions. Uh, if you have debt and you refinance it right now, they're saying that's going to be okay as long as not a, not extending the maturity, not getting extra money. If you get extra money, they might say it's not the same thing. The home equity interest is gone. So if you use home equity to buy cars, pay for college, all that interest is non-deductible now. If you use a home equity to put on an improvement of a kitchen, or put on a new room or put on a roof, that would still be deductible as interest. So you really have to look at what you use your debt for. They've always had the acquisition rules where people would go out and buy a house for $500,000 and they get a $400,000 mortgage and two years later they get a higher appraisal and they go out and get more money. The more money they got on that mortgage was really never deductible. The IRS just really didn't crack down on it. So if your original acquisition debt was $400,000, if you didn't do an improvement when I got a $500,000 mortgage, you really still can only deduct four-fifths of the mortgage. A lot of people don't know that. A lot of people weren't following the rules. So they're trying to crack down on it by increasing the standard uh, exemption amount. They're figuring a lot lots of people will be able to itemize, so they're kind of kind of getting rid of some of the problems of having to police that rule by doing that. But, you know, if you're down in New York City, I don't think you can buy a house for less than a million dollars. So there's going to be limitations on what your mortgage interest is. So you just got to be aware of that and what the benefits are. As realtors, when you talk to your clients and you spill and say, hey, you know, you buy a house, you get a real estate tax deduction, you get a mortgage interest deduction. That's not necessarily true anymore. You really have to know more about your client and what, what they fall into and uh, what they can do. If you're single, Again, it's the $12,000 standard deduction, so you might be able, you know, if you have a mortgage and you have 10000 in taxes, you're probably going to be over the $12,000. So circumstances, everybody's not equal as much as they used to be. It's very different depending on who you are and what you do. Uh, 529 plans, uh, the federal said you, oh, and, well, itemized deductions too, I forgot, I can't remember if I passed or not, but New York State decided they weren't going to follow the federal rules. So we were telling our clients when the federal law came out, you know, you might not have to keep track of your itemized deductions anymore. And now New York said, came back and said you can. So maybe you can get some deductions for your real estate taxes, for your mortgage interest, uh, but not on the, necessarily, might not be on the federal, but it might just be on New York State. So New York State's trying to make it better, but by doing that, they're making it more complicated because you can't just follow the federal. You gotta see what, you know, federal might be one set of rules, state might be a different set of rules. So you gotta kinda, look back and forth all the time with the bonus depreciation, different rules, itemized deduction, different rules. So it's getting more complicated overall to do anything and make sure you, you get the best deductions you can. Uh, the 529 plans are savings account for kids going to college. They expanded this on the federal level to be able to use it for uh, K through 12 tuition. New York State doesn't follow that rule. So if you take a distribution out and there's taxable income on it, you're going to be taxed at New York State, not the federal level though. Itemized deductions, again, okay, here's a state, you know, so state purpose, you still can do it. Again, we talked about the charitable deductions. Again, you might, 
uh, put your money all in one year. Now, nonprofits like to get money every year. They hate to get it once every two, three years. So some people are using donor advised funds. That's a, a charitable fund that you can put your money into. And if you want to bunch it up, you put it all in one year in that fund, and then you can advise them to give it to charity A, you know, 2,000 this year, 2,000 next year, 2,000 the year after. So some people are using that kind of mechanism to kind of do their funding for charitable deductions. So there's a lot of different things you can consider and look at, uh, but you have to be careful because if you're trying to get deductions for some of this stuff, it's, it's going to be harder now. Uh, Pass-through losses, hopefully this doesn't really apply to anybody here, but there is a limitation if you have more than $500,000 on a pass-through entity and you have a loss in that, you can't offset all your incomes. So you have a million dollar loss, you're going to be limited to $500,000 in that year. So you might have other entities that have taxable income and one entity has a big loss, you might not be able to use all the losses from that entity, so just to be aware of that. Uh, You know, so you got a simple rental property. You need to have basis. You have to be at risk. You know, is a passive activity limitation or not? And then there's this new excess business loss limitation. So there's a lot of hurdles to get over to sometimes to make sure you understand the new law and take advantage of it or be aware of where it can hurt you. Uh, again, just briefly here, uh, they increased the exemption prior law. If you died and you were only worth Five million four, you were subject to a state tax, but if you're worth ten million, you were. Now it's ten thousand nine hundred eighty dollars. Uh, ten million. Ten million. Uh, that was for a couple. No, under new law, it's eleven million and twenty-two million. So a lot less people are going to be subject to a state tax right now. Uh, again, we have new people in Congress and they're talking about relooking at the estate tax law and everything like that. But right now, uh, most people probably will not be subject to uh, state tax. I think that's pretty much all we had, other than questions on anything we went over, or anything you might have heard. Anybody have questions on anything? Okay. Thank you for coming.